Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Property Tax Division to order and pursuant to Rule 10.01. The first order of business is that we need to a roll call to determine who's present. The clerk, Mr. Peterson, will now take the roll. Chair Joachim. Present. Joachim, present. Vice Chair Gomez. Present. Gomez, present. Representative Hurtas. Representative Hurtas. Representative Anderson. Anderson here. Anderson present. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Becker Finn present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Fisher present. Representative Green. Present. Green present. Representative Hassan. Present. Hassan, present. Representative Marcourt. Present. Marcourt, present. Representative Mortensen. Mortensen, present. Mortensen, present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, present. Pulowski, present. Representative Torkelson. Present. Torkelson, present. Uh, Representative Hurtas. All right, uh, that is the role. And, uh, Quorum is uh, present, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I want to note to all the committee uh, members and those in the public that the documents for today have been posted to the committee web page and members should have received them in an email too. The first item we have on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from January 20th. Representative Gomez, have you had a chance to look at the minutes? I have, I'd like to move approval of the minutes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does anyone have any question, uh, questions about the minutes? Got a minute here. Seeing none, all those in favor in approving the minutes from January 20th, say aye. Uh, unmute yourself and say aye. 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 All those opposed? No? The motion is approved and the minutes are adopted. Today we finished the over. Uh, today we're going to be finishing the overview from House Research on the Minnesota property tax system. After that, we're going to introduce a, uh, various groups that we deal with in the property tax committee on a regular basis, so you get a chance to get to put names to faces and know what areas of expertise they have, and learn more about their organizations and their priorities for this year. I've also included a memo on local uh, option sales tax for members and the public to review. The goal there is for the committee to establish some standards and a more transparent process in how we define and measure the local sales tax proposals. That will be a larger topic for discussion once we start hearing those tax, local sales tax uh, proposals in our committee. But for today, we'll have Ms. Hagler continue on with the overview and she'll be going over the local sales tax and tax increment financing. I believe we left off on the slide 42 uh, last Wednesday. So Ms. Hagler, could you please introduce yourself for the record and start whenever you are ready. Um, Madam Chair, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can Ms. Hagler. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and um, members. Uh, for the record, my name is Alex Hagler with House Research. Um, I will be going over the last two items on the presentation today, local option sales taxes and uh, tax increment financing. Um, so to start, there are a few kinds of taxes that may be imposed at the local level. The local option sales taxes are generally are general sales taxes that would apply to any transaction that a state sales tax would apply to. Um, the revenue from these taxes are used to fund certain projects within uh, the jurisdiction imposing them, be that a city, county, uh, sometimes special taxing district um, in the odd case. Um, so the jurisdiction must come to the legislature for approval before one of these taxes can be imposed. And similarly, the uh, jurisdiction must submit uh, the tax for voter approval once legislative approval is given. Um, as Chair Yua King's memo explains, in 2019, the legislature enacted some requirements for local sales taxes. Uh, first, the municipality uh, wishing to impose the tax must come to the legislature for approval of a special law. 
um, then the, uh, the governing body of the uh, municipality must adopt a resolution stating the proposed tax rate, a description of the projects meant to be funded with the proceeds of the tax, and the regional, the regional significance of the project and the amount of revenue expected to be raised uh, before the tax expires. Uh, these resolutions must be submitted to the tax committee by January 31st of the year in which the jurisdiction is seeking the special law. Uh, that means even if a resolution was submitted uh, the year prior and a bill was introduced and heard unless the special law was enacted, another resolution uh, must be sent in again, even if nothing has changed. Um, detailed in the submissions should be a description of the regional significance of the projects. Now there's no definition of uh, quote regional significance in statute, but generally uh, the project should benefit more than just the residents of the local jurisdiction imposing the tax. Um, also detailed in the resolution should be the length of time the jurisdiction is seeking to impose the tax. Um, so once the bill is heard and, uh, in this committee, and if it is enacted uh, at the end of session, the jurisdiction um, must then submit to the voters uh, for approval at a general election, and the election must occur within the two-year period after the special law is approved. Um, so next, I'll move on to the county transportation taxes, and um, just over half of Minnesota counties impose this tax, and this is also a general sales tax that would apply to anything the state sales tax applies to for transactions that occur uh, within the county or deliver to the, uh, within that county, uh, but the revenue is used for county transportation projects rather than going just to a general um, specific um, development projects. So uh, counties are not required to come to the legislature for um, imposing this tax um, because statute allows the counties to impose them by resolution of the county board. Um, most counties impose these at a 0.5% rate, uh, but a handful do so at a 2.5, rate. Uh, like I said, um, counties don't need to come to the legislature for approval, nor do they need the approval of the voters. And then lastly, in the miscellaneous box on the slide, there are taxes that are imposed um, in certain circumstances or uh, for specific transactions. For example, local lodging taxes are only imposed on lodging and food and beverage taxes are only imposed on restaurant or bar transactions. And these taxes are less common, but they do exist across the state. Um, lodging taxes may be imposed without legislative approval, but um, the statute that authorizes them does impose some limitations. So you may see bills um, come through committee that want exceptions to those limitations. And similarly, um, they don't need to be submitted to voters for approval. Um, for food and beverage and entertainment taxes, they, um, they do require legislative approval and entertainment taxes are, um, there are very few of them, but they generally encompass admissions um, and amusement um, transactions. Um, so this slide just shows, um, is a screenshot of the house research publications page where um, local sales taxes information is housed. Um, these publications do go into a bit more detail about how to get a local sales tax approved. And um, it also provides some information on local sales taxes that are currently imposed. And there you can see um, some that have been enacted but have not been imposed, some that um, have been imposed and have already expired, and then some information on local lodging and transportation taxes there as well. Um, another good resource is the Department of Revenue um, sales tax fact sheet. Um, it um, uh, details um, guidance on all of the sales taxes that are currently imposed, lodging, food and beverage, and admissions. And um, that is, um, there's a link there and hopefully it is working, um, but it's pretty easy to find on the department's webpage if you want to um, go into more information on that. Um, so that ends the local sales tax 
um, portion of the presentation. Madam Chair, I don't know if you wanted to take questions now or we, until the end, otherwise I can move on to, to tax increment financing. Let's uh, move on to TIFF and then take questions after that. Sounds good, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, so tax increment financing at a very high level, um, very high level um, description of it, but tax increment financing is an economic development tool that is used to induce development or redevelopment. And it captures the additional property taxes paid as a result of the development activity to pay for the cost of the development or uh, improvement. So districts are created and certified locally and they don't need legislative approval to just um, come into existence or be certified. Um, one of the main requirements to certify a district is that it must pass the but for test which means that um, development or redevelopment would not occur but for the use of TIF. And it's up to the municipalities um, to make that determination within themselves. Chapter 469 of Minnesota statutes outlines the requirements for establishing a TIF district. There are um, a plan needs to be in place and certain um, things that happen at the city level. Um, that the legislature um, may not see that kind of goes on behind the scenes. Um, and this chapter also imposes uh, certain limitations on what districts can do. For example, um, different kinds of districts have um, different duration limits and also statute um, dictates what increment, what the increment generated um, can be used for. Um, so just a quick um, little note about what kinds of districts exist around the state. Um, this slide uh, comes from a report that the legislature, um, that the state auditor puts out, um, I think every two years. Um, so each um, type of district is listed there, uh, followed by how um, frequently they occur around the state. And as you can see, redevelopment districts are um, the most popular, most common, and uh, they do have the longest duration at um, 25 years. Um, housing districts are uh, account for the second largest number of districts, and they are used to fund certain affordable housing projects. Um, so because districts originally Originally locally, uh, the legislature only gets involved when a district needs an exception to general TIF uh, laws. And um, the next few slides will show uh, kind of little uh, snapshots of what those look like. Um, so here's an example of a, um, of a bill that was seeking to extend the five-year rule limitation. And the five-year rule um, is a limitation imposed by statute that requires development activity within the district to be uh, finished within five years of the district certification. Uh, this may be the most common type of special legislation that comes through the committee. Um, bills such as this seek um, extensions of the five-year rule uh, if there was some sort of development delay or special circumstance that occurred within development that delayed the project. Um, so the highlighted portion of this text uh, where it says um, is considered and then on the very last line if activities are undertaken prior to 2017 that's just um, that date is just then showing that oh this district was supposed to ex um, the five-year rule was supposed to expire before 2017 but we're giving them extra time and it's probably a five-year extension um, the next type of um, common legislation is the duration extension. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, TIF districts have a statutory, statutorily defined lifespan. Um, so uh, this type of legislation just seeks to extend uh, the life of a district. So instead of decertifying by the time specified in statute, some districts uh, may need more time uh, because of special circumstances and they ask for an extension of the district. So this one, um, the city of Richfield was seeking to extend um, this sp specific district by 10 years. Um, so this was just a, a very um, high level uh, explanation of TIF, um, but more information can be found on the House Research website. Um, 
that's on the house page, the TIF primer, when you, when you go to that section, it, it breaks down um, certain limitations or um, aspects of the TIF, TIF statute that um, generally um, we get a lot of questions about. So there are really good explanations there. And also um, the Office of the State Auditor oversees local uh, TIF compliance and um, compiles reports, newsletters, and guides, and all of that information can be found on the state auditor's website. Um, and there, I believe there is an option to subscribe to weekly newsletters where they send out um, little tidbits of um, TIF information. So if you wanted to do that, uh, the best way to do that would be on the state auditor's website. And um, that, Madam Chair, concludes the um, property tax overview. Thank you so much, Ms. Hagler. Members, are there any questions for Ms. Hagler on local option sales tax or tax increment financing? I see Representative Gomez's has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that overview, Ms. Hagler. I, I feel like in the, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like last year, one of the things that was hard for me was like this piece about regional significance for local option sales taxes. And um, so I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about uh, kind of what that means and what does and doesn't maybe fit the definition. Um, Cause it seemed like more and more it was, there were like sort of um, municipalities seeking to fund what are kind of like basic city things like parks and roads with local option sales taxes. And if you can just kind of talk about the appropriateness of that and how, how that standard is met. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Ms. Hagler. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Gomez. Um, so as I said, there isn't an exact uh, definition in statute, but um, if you're thinking about an area in which, um, you know, I can't recall off the top of my head which project this, this was specifically, but let's say there was a, a library that it was the only library um, in, you know, for two or three counties. So that one library would um, service um, two or three counties. So you would have not just the county uh, where the library is, but the people who are coming to the library um, from you know, many towns, many counties over. That um, is kind of what, we're, what regional significance um, means. And um, the, because it's not defined in statute, it's a, it's a little bit hard to say, oh, this project definitely would qualify, this de definitely does not. And um, uh, the chairs and um, you as legislators have discretion as to whether that's very narrow or very broad. Um, so it, if it's something like a, a park in a city where the only people who go to this park are the people in the city, then maybe that's not as regionally significant as something that services um, many cities or many counties, if that um, helps to answer your question. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Do you have any follow-up? No, oh, that's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. I want to note that Representative Hurtas has joined, joined us during the presentation. And then um, I want to thank Representative Gomez for that question. That is the essence of why I set the memo out so that we could have those discussions on what we think is a regional significance. So Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Chair Joachim. Uh, uh, for Ms. Hagler, I'm trying to get a little un uh, better understanding on TIF around housing. Uh, when TIF is used for housing, are there restrictions as to who can be uh, used in the housing or not? In other words, are, can students be in housing that uh, TIF is used to make, or how does that all work in that area? Ms. Hagler. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Fisher, so the TIF housing districts, they do have some um, income requirements around affordability and some of that kind of ties to uh, the federal tax law and, um, you know, uh, section eight or, um, you know, low income housing, that kind of thing. I don't specifically recall it being able to be used for um, just student housing. There's also um, the ability to do workforce housing as well. Um, but um, if it's something that's specifically built for students, I would have to double check on that. Mr. Fisher, Representative Fisher, do you have follow-up? 
Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Joachim. Uh, I'm more curious is on the uh, on the student ones actually around in uh, some communities look at wanting to use TIF to build uh, housing that would help youth who are homeless and ho homeless youth are not unusual that sometimes they are also students. So I'm kind of curious is uh, would there be uh, concerns about if there be any uh, problems that they would run into issues if they if some of the students who are there or some people who are living there who are homeless youth were also students that would cause any problems or not because I'd hate to see that tool be loosed over uh, that kind of situation. Ms. Hagler, do you have any follow up? Madam Chair and Representative Fisher, I'm, again, sorry, I would have to just double check on that, but um, because they're um, they do have income requirements. It, 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 you know, it may not be specifically for homeless, but I do. I will just follow up with you on that offline, if that's okay. Representative Fisher, and I'm seeing a thumbs up. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question for Ms. Hagler: You mentioned on the local option sales taxes that items that are subject to the state tax also are, el are eligible for the local option tax. But what about large items like automobiles, for example? Can they be exempted by the local unit in their local option tax? Uh, Ms. Hagler. Madam Chair and Representative Anderson, yes. So um, because automobiles have a specific um, kind of in lieu of sales tax rate, um, they don't, well, they wouldn't be subject to the standard state sales tax. They're subject to a, a different kind of tax. So uh, local, rates wouldn't apply. Um, so when, it, when I mentioned that um, any transaction that involves the state sales tax, that's 6.875%, the local um, option sales taxes would stack on top of those. And that's why sometimes you would see if you go to the store and it actually says what your tax amount is, sometimes it's you know more like 7.3 or 7.5%. Um, that's just accounting for the um, uh, local sales tax on top of the state sales tax. There isn't a um, you know price amount limitation. So if you bought something very expensive, like a, I don't know, $2,000 large TV, and because that's subject to state sales tax, those um, local sales taxes would um, stack on top. Representative Anderson, follow up. Um, members, I will give you another second here. Do I see any more hands? See no more hands. I think we'll go on to the rest of our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hagler. Um, next up, we're going to hear from some of the organizations that come before our committee um, so that you can see who covers what areas in case you're thinking about having legislation um, drafted. So first up, we have uh, Mr. Gary Carlson from the League of Minnesota Cities. Please introduce yourself for the record and your organization and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Mr. Carlson. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Gary Carlson. I work with the League of Minnesota Cities. And just for a little perspective and background, I know several of you have served on city councils or been mayors. Uh, the League was formed in 1913. And uh, we uh, basically right now have 835 member cities out of the 853 cities across the state. And our largest um, non-member city right now is the city of Roscoe. If you're not familiar with Roscoe, it's in Stearns County, population 103. That's in Representative Damoth's district. So virtually every city uh, in the state of Minnesota is a member of the league. And if the city of Roscoe or any other of the 18, uh, 17 other cities that are not members call us, we certainly provide them assistance. And just briefly, we don't just uh, lobby. Uh, in fact, most of what the league does is, is really to provide services to cities across the state. We provide legal assistance, conference and training services, uh, investment options. Uh, they can invest their property tax receipts uh, and get a little, little higher rate of return if they choose. We provide a lot of insurance coverage through our insurance trust for property casualty and workers comp. And of course, what I do is I work with you at the legislature on various issues of concern to cities. Um, 
I have provided the committee with a handout um, with information on some of the issues that will come before the committee. And I don't plan to get into great detail today. I certainly can talk to each of you individually and I have been scheduling those meetings. So I hope to get to all of you in the near future. Uh, just briefly, how our policies are developed. Uh, the league has a policy development process that occurs in the summer months. And we spend time talking about uh, issues, challenges that cities face and develop those policies. Uh, every city has one vote in our process. Uh, so the city of Roscoe, had, well, if they were a member, they would have one vote and the city of Minneapolis has one vote in establishing our agenda. So in the handout, I've discussed a number of issues um, uh, for you that, uh, that I will be spending time with you on. Local government aid is one of the uh, prominent pieces of legislation or, or uh, statutory matter that I handle with you. Uh, the LGA formula has been around since the 70s. I think we went through that in the presentation the other day. Um, the league supports the existing formula, but uh, we do acknowledge that we're coming up on a decennial census uh, review and update of that formula. Uh, the last major update was uh, made in 2013. And uh, usually with the decennial census data, we do spend time looking at that formula to see how it's functioning and see if there's adjustments needed. Uh, we also support reinstating the annual inflation adjustment that was repealed back, uh, I believe it was in the special session of 2003. Uh, that was a inflation adjustment that did adjust the appropriation to continue to provide additional tax relief uh, to cities across the state. Um, one other thing is we support an acceleration of the payment structure for LGA. A number of years ago during state budget crises actually Way back in the early 1980s, uh, LGA was bumped back in the state fiscal year. I'm sorry, uh, yes, bumped back in the state fiscal year and back in the city, city calendar year. And now those payments are made at the very end of, or the last six months of our calendar year at the local level. In 2019, we did a one-time uh, early appropriation in June uh, to pay a portion of that money in June. Uh, we would like to see that made permanent. Uh, and finally, we oppose reductions in the appropriation for LGA and for, for obvious reasons. Uh, when LGA reductions are made, usually it's retroactive and cities don't have the ability to easily adjust their budgets or raise other revenues. Moving on briefly on direct property tax relief, we'll be working with you on that. Uh, we support targeted property tax relief through the, uh, the Homestead Credit Program and through the targeting program or Homestead Credit Refund Program renters refund and targeting programs. Uh, our, our, our more specific support for those programs rather grew out of a situation back when we still had the old homestead, which was actually a credit on the tax statement and those reimbursement, reimbursements were frequently cut. Uh, we found that problematic at the local level and that's why we began to encourage you to use direct taxpayer relief as an alternative. Ms. Hagler just discussed tax increment financing. I won't get into many details, except to say we, we strongly support that as an economic development, redevelopment and housing tool. Uh, we uh, are working on some flexibility changes to assist with um, challenges that have resulted from the slowdown of the economy during the pandemic. And we'll be bringing legislation to the committee, hopefully uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, as Ms. Hagler discussed, the local sales tax uh, is a big issue for our cities. We have uh, for the last several years introduced a bill uh, that does allow a, or would allow a city to impose a sales tax. And Representative Gomez in that bill, um, actually uh, Chair Yuakim introduced it last year. It was House File 1970. Uh, we tried to define regional significance by various projects that were typical of local sales taxes that were approved by the legislature in the past. So uh, we'd like to discuss that issue along with the individual bills that will be coming forward. Um, we would, however, uh, still continue. Uh, we would agree to uh, a local referendum requirement, uh, which is slightly different than the way the county uh, transportation sales tax works. They don't have to have a local referendum for approval. And then the last three issues briefly, lodging taxes. Representative Carlson has carried a bill to clarify how those lodging taxes are applied in situations where we have an accommodation intermediary like Travelocity that is basically booking the rooms. Uh, we have been seeking legislation to clarify that the local lodging tax applies to the full consideration of that, uh, of that facility. 
Uh, public safety protection districts, Representative Becker Finn on this committee carried a bill last uh, biennium that would allow local units of government to combine and work together to provide uh, police and or fire protection services over a multi-jurisdictional area. Uh, we think that's a very good idea that uh, would you know, definitely provide some efficiencies and economies of scale especially where uh, cities are having challenges attracting uh, sufficient firefighters, uh, this would allow us to basically uh, develop a larger taxing district for those services. And then finally, uh, the last thing I'll mention is special service districts. Uh, there's a chapter that you uh, frequently deal with, chapter 428A, I believe it is, that allows cities at the request of homeowners or businesses to create special service districts or housing improvement districts uh, to provide extra services uh, in those areas. Uh, we, we support that language. Uh, they, uh, both of those provisions have sunset dates of June 30th of 2028. Uh, why so late, I don't really remember, but we'd like to remove that sunset because this has been effectively used and also to allow special service districts where you have mixed use development uh, to include uh, the residential properties that may be located above the lower level retail space because right now only the retail operations can pay for those services. Uh, Madam Chair, I will be working with you on other bills that come before the committee just trying to uh, provide information on the impact on cities. So uh, that is briefly in a nutshell, uh, the league's agenda for this year that would uh, fall within the purview of this committee and I would uh, stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And I uh, see one member question, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome back, uh, Mr. Carlson. This uh, marks uh, yours and my 11th year of collaborating together on uh, issues regarding cities. And uh, particularly, I uh, am reaching out to you to ask uh, with regard to your statement about getting together with cities in August if uh, you had any discussions about, and maybe for the benefit of the new committee members, if you would uh, talk a little bit about the perennial problem of the growing number of cities that go off formula with regard to local government aid. Uh, this has been a, uh, a chronic problem and uh, certainly uh, these numbers of cities that are represented by going off formula, which I believe is in excess of 100, uh, is now 12% of your membership, but represents, according to my calculations, nearly a third of the state's population. So uh, all of these people, in these communities are one Minnesota and contributing to a pot of money that is supposed to be uh, redistributed on the basis of need and uh, Anyway, uh, I think you know where I'm going with this. I'd appreciate your comments uh, about what progress, if any, has been made during the summer. Thank you, Representative Hurtas. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Madam Chair, Representative Hurtas, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we did discuss uh, in our policy committees changes to the LGA formula this last summer. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that just like these meetings, those were done remotely or, or via Zoom. And uh, we did have discussions about the need to modify the formula. And one of the things that did come up was, as I indicated in my discussion about LGA, is waiting to see when we get the uh, updated decennial census data, which has, has usually been used since the early 1990s to drive that formula, and then use that to try to develop uh, formulas that um, would acknowledge some of the shifting of LGA that is clearly occurring. And let me just briefly comment on that if I could. Uh, you know, we've seen a very strong rebound in property values uh, in some areas of the state and not so uh, rapid growth in property values in other areas. And the LGA formula is in part predicated on the, the strength of the tax base of a community. And we've seen a growing uh, disparity or a growing uh, um, uh, difference between uh, the rebounds since the Great Recession and even the impacts of the current uh, recession on prop, uh, especially residential property values. And that all needs to be considered in the development of a new formula. But let me just say that we are committed. Uh, we have had discussions with the Metro Cities organization that you'll hear from, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities and the Small Cities Association. 
and we have met with health research and Senate Council and research staff uh, to, to begin the process. So uh, I will be meeting with you next week and we can talk in greater detail about that, but let me give you the commitment that it is um, one of those things that comes up about every 10 years and we will be working to come up with some new formula adjustments um, and we will certainly consider your observations. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And Representative Hurtaz, you and I have to talk too because that's something I want us to work on over the summer. Yes, um, uh, um, and uh, I wanted to just uh, follow up on, <clears throat> on the comment made about rebounding uh, real estate values. Uh, this is a, a chronic problem, uh, not only in the metro area, but in other areas. Uh, of course, the three rules of real estate are location, 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 and that oftentimes drives values, but uh, there's really no direct correlation uh, between the property value and the ability of its occupant to pay those increased taxes. So, uh, what we have are uh, growing numbers of uh, seniors who uh, write every day and are complaining about uh, being driven out of their home by the rise of uh, property taxes and particularly having the uh, coincidence of residing in, uh, in an urban area where values are driven higher by demand. Thank, thank you for you. that, Mr. Carlson. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And up next, we have Mr. Hilgard. Can you please introduce yourself and what organization you're with for the record and proceed? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Matt Hilgard, and I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC is an organization that represents all of the state's 87 counties. Good to see you all again. I think we were, uh, Mr. Carlson and I were just here, was it two weeks ago, uh, to talk about local governments and CARES Act spending. And I, I think you'll also be having a hearing on property tax administrators next week with the assessing group. So thanks again for having us. As you know, uh, counties play a significant role in the property tax tax world. Um, but really this year, our focus has been on pandemic response. And we talked a little bit last week about CARES Act, but counties and local governments in general have also been trying to respond and help those in need and businesses in need by either doing uh, penalty delays or forgiveness for the property tax payments, license fees uh, for, and payments forgiveness, business relief grants, with many, which many counties actually funded for, not only out of CARES funds, but through an additional levy dollars towards those business grant programs. And then as you know, right now, we are also running a second a state business relief grant program for local communities. Uh, so our work really, our, our biggest priorities this year is the pandemic response in relation to local public health efforts, economic and business relief, workforce uh, training and getting folks back into work um, at good wages and also housing investments. As it relates to this committee, and I know that's what you're most interested in, um, our biggest concern and priority is limiting any additional burden to property taxpayers. Uh, uh, Gary Carlson, Mr. Carlson mentioned um, uh, local government aid programs. For us, that means county program aid. And really, uh, if you were to take county program aid away for counties, uh, that's our largest general purpose aid that the state gives us. You would see anywhere from three to 4% to upwards of 20% increases in levies. And so this is a program that provides direct levy relief. Um, it is a significant program. It is a priority for counties, and we are hoping to protect those investments and make sure that there are no uh, increases to property taxpayers through cuts to there. The other way that this committee can try to preserve additional burdens to property taxpayers is to make sure that we aren't looking at uh, proposals that have significant shifts to property taxpayers. And you'll see, and many members already know uh, through their work on this committee, that there are bills that come before the committee that oddly enough don't cost things, yet they do provide benefits. And that's typically because there is a shift to them. Um, for example, a way to do this is reduce tax rates. Uh, that's of course lessening the tax burden for some and increasing it for others. And I know that there's been proposals around 4D and other tax rates to either increase or reduce, but just be cognizant of where those shifts are occurring and who's being affected by those shifts. The biggest example um, of, of something that can affect property taxpayers is um, exclusions. So, um, and I, at the, probably the biggest exclusion that we talk about uh, from county's perspective is the disabled veterans market value exclusion. Now I wanna be crystal clear so I'm not getting 100 or 1000 emails tomorrow that AMC is not advocating to get rid of a benefit for the disabled veterans market value exclusion. But the way that this is drafted right now is that the state, or I should say local governments, provide a benefit for uh, disabled veterans in, in the state of Minnesota 
um, up to $300,000 in excluded property tax value, which means a significant am amount of property tax payers that are disabled veterans do not pay their uh, property taxes. However, it's an exclusion. And so what we've seen is that this program, um, 2008 data, showed that $1.1 billion worth of property value was excluded from taxes statewide. In 2018, uh, that's two years assessment old data, that program has already grown to $2.7 billion. So I just want members to, to see kind of how large that program has grown. Um, AMC is, of course, um, supportive of these benefits completely, but we'd like to know that as legislators continue um, kind of tinkering with the program dynamics, that this is a real cost. And in some areas, it's more than 1% of their tax base that this exclusion has become. And remember, that's other residents, that's other veterans, that's other business owners, that's other re uh, families paying for what the, the, those program benefits. Um, Enbridge pipeline dispute, um, we've heard and we've had um, committee presentations uh, throughout the last three years on uh, this uh, issue. As members know, in the state of Minnesota, um, local property uh, assessors do a lot of the property tax assessments. However, the state does the assessment for all state utilities. Um, Enbridge in 2013 or 15 appealed their property taxes and uh, for three years worth of property taxes and the state and Enbridge are basically disagreeing over how much the property is worth by a tune of over multiple billions of dollars. Now, uh, it's important to note that this case has gone to the tax court, to the Supreme Court, back to the tax court, back to the Supreme Court and is now remanded back to the tax court again. So we basically have almost a decade's worth of tax court petitions in years up for debate. And it is a dark cloud that hasn't rained, it hasn't poured. Hopefully it will be a trickle, but it could have significant consequences to the tunes of tens and tens of millions of dollars in ordered refunds for some of our smallest counties throughout the state. So it is an issue that we should be at least uh, aware of that it is out there. Property tax simplification, I have to give a lot of credit to former representative uh, uh, Whalen, Abigail Whalen, who started this uh, efforts, but we would love to continue that and maybe even take a small bite by trying to consolidate some of the tax classifications just in the residential area where there wouldn't be shifts. So just try to focus on consolidating the ones that are at the same rate. And then the last issue I might mention um, is because it is kind of dual jurisdiction and we're honored to have the civil law and judiciary chair on this committee, uh, but it is actually something that's been coming up recently in our met our regional uh, counties. It's assessor safety. We've had a few isolated incidents where when assessors are doing their job, county assessors of going in for the quintile reviews and doing in-person inspections, they have been at risk of danger or have felt that they are at risk of danger. Um, and they are potentially interested in exploring some ideas of data sharing that would allow them to at least know a better sense of the properties that they are entering. So it is something that uh, might not actually start in this committee, but has an impact on the folks who actually do property tax administration. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to stand for any questions, but thank you for your time today. Members, do we have any questions for Mr. Hilgard? Seeing none, thank you so much. I want to keep us moving along here. So, well, Mr. Fenske, you're up next. Um, please introduce yourself, your organization, and uh, then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. I'm Steve Fenske with the Minnesota Association of Townships. We're a statewide, uh, we're a nonprofit company representing townships statewide. There are 1,781, and all of one of those, all but one of those, are members of our association. We are uh, very similar to, to the league and, and to the county organizations you just heard about. We focus on education uh, and supporting town officers. We uh, manage an insurance trust on their behalf and we represent their interests at the Capitol. Um, the, the, I think the big thing to remember here with townships as compared to some others is they're largely property tax dependent. They're uh, uh, at any year, you can look at the state auditor's report and it'll be around 75% property tax dependent. They don't have the same kind of opportunities for some of the other uh, taxes as, as other groups do. Uh, for example, sales tax. There's just not a lot of commerce in a lot of townships. They're very rural. Uh, so they have different opportunities uh, for revenue. Um, 
also different uh, than others is the property tax that they get is set by their voters. It is not set by the elected officials. So sometimes uh, those folks maintain, uh, uh, those voters maintain a very stable budget. Other times they may agree to increase taxes on themselves or reduce it a great deal. So uh, towns have a, a little different um, budgeting matter to contend with uh, than some others do. Uh, given those, those issues, uh, what I want to point out, uh, first of all, thank uh, legislators uh, for in the past was town aid. It's very similar to local government aid, but it's dedicated to townships. Uh, and that was funded last year uh, in the, in the uh, last biennium, I believe 10 million per year in the biennium. And that, uh, that helps a great deal for townships. Uh, really, a, a little bit goes a long way uh, for these folks. They typically do not have a lot of municipal buildings, a lot of staff. So this money is uh, often going right into the roads, right into the services being offered. Uh, so we'd like to thank you for that and uh, ask that, that be continued. It's an important piece of, of what funds townships and with uncertainty, not knowing how they're going to uh, be able to collect revenue on the upcoming year. Uh, it, I think it's going to become more important. Uh, the only other thing I wanna add today is uh, a mention of the local boards of appeal and equalization. Uh, townships can uh, form these boards and review property taxes and work with their, their local, local uh, property tax payers. Um, but because of uh, how the, the uh, state had to shut down last year, some of them temporarily lost the ability to hold that board. And so uh, we're in the process of, of trying to restore that uh, a year earlier. Typically, if a township missed a year, uh, they wouldn't be able to get that power back for two years. And many townships didn't feel they could hold that board safely last year in March and April. And so uh, they weren't able to do it. So one of the things you're going to be hearing about is uh, a request that uh, as a one-time change, we allow townships to hold that board this year uh, rather than wait an, an extra year. And Madam Chair, I'll leave it there uh, for questions if, uh, if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Fenske. Members, any questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Fenske. Next, we'll move on to Mr. Peterson. Will you please you. introduce yourself and the organization you represent for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Bradley Peterson. I work with the firm of Flaherty and Hood in St. Paul, and we represent the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. The CGMC represents over 100 cities outside of the seven county metro area. And while we cover numerous policy areas, such as infrastructure funding, environmental regulatory issues, economic development, uh, things of that nature, uh, the thing that you will most likely see us in front of this committee on is local government aid. Uh, CGMC has long supported the basic structure and goals of the LGA program. LGA has been instrumental in ensuring that Minnesota has vibrant, thriving communities in every corner of our state. Moreover, during the pandemic, LGA has allowed our cities to continue to provide basic services such as police and fire protection, quality infrastructure, community amenities such as parks, trails, and libraries. All services paid for in many cities through LGA, and all services that will be important for the post-pandemic economic recovery. Uh, with that in mind, our highest priority for this session is to ensure that however the state's budget situation is resolved, it is done in a way that does not reduce local government aid. We were very encouraged that Governor Walz's budget unveiled yesterday did not impact LGA, and we are hopeful that the legislature will follow that example. And with that, I'm happy to be done and take any questions that you might have. Mr. Peterson, the brevity is appreciated. Um, members, any question for Mr. Peterson? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Next up, we have Ms. Nauman. Please introduce yourself, what organization you're with, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. My name is Patricia Nauman, and I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities. Our, uh, our legal name is the Association of Metropolitan Municipalities, which is 17 syllables, and we <laughs> use Metro Cities as, because it's easier to, uh, easier to communicate with that. So Metro Cities is an association of, of cities in the seven county metropolitan area. It's a voluntary membership association. 
with a large and diverse membership, uh, including the core cities all the way out to St. Francis and um, just everything in between. So we have cities of all shapes and sizes in our, in our membership. The uh, association, just very briefly, is governed by a 19 member board of directors of city officials in the seven county metropolitan area. And its policy positions are developed in a manner that is very similar to the League of Minnesota Cities that Mr. Carlson uh, indicated a few moments ago. And that is that our policies are developed by our member cities each year and they are developed um, with a consensus of the membership. So if something does not have consensus, it does not make it into uh, the uh, foundation of the policies for the year. The uh, uh, Metro Cities plays a unique role in the local government advocacy community in that it is the entity, metro-wide entity that represents cities at the Metropolitan Council. So we uh, watch pretty much everything that the council does. It was a key reason that the association was created in the early 1970s. And uh, we do pretty much monitor and respond to the activity of the Metropolitan Council because much of their activity has implications for the work of local governments in the region. In addition, we lobby on issues at the state legislature and at the executive branch. And those are the statewide issues such as transportation, the aids and revenues I'll get into in a minute here and a variety of other uh, issues that are, are statewide in nature, but that may have metropolitan significance or be of interest or concern to cities in the metropolitan area. The issues, uh, Madam Chair and members, um, in front of this committee that bear on the work of Metro Cities, and I know some of these will um, resonate because you've been talking about them already today and heard from Mr. Carlson on some that we have some overlap on, but I will just hit on a few highlights uh, for 2021. Uh, local government aid and, and Representative Hurtas mentioned a few moments ago the concerns about cities sort of getting lopped off of that formula. That is a, a key concern for metro cities. I've been monitoring and watching that for the last few years. Um, metro cities did support the reforms that were done in 2013, and we've been involved and engaged in every discussion on reforms with other local government associations over the years. And as Mr. Carlson pointed out, uh, with the census, we're do really for another uh, look under the hood of the formula. And one of the key issues will be the fact that some cities are just precipitously dropping off the formula. And even though it may be that the, form, it's, the formula is working the way it was structured to, um, there are many concerns by cities that are just all of a sudden finding themselves with you know, the loss of sometimes very significant amounts of aid. Metro cities also keeps an eye on the LGA formula and has worked over the years to advocate for funding under the local government aid program that does sort of try to give as fair a shake as possible to cities in the metro area. We recognize it's a statewide program and that there are very great needs in greater Minnesota. Um, we also recognize that some cities in the metro area can get sort of lost in the shuffle, particularly the older, some of the older suburbs, but not just. Um, and so our job is to make sure that their needs are, are represented when there are changes made to the formula. So we look forward to working with you, Madam Chair, members on those issues. Uh, Metro Cities cares about the fiscal disparities program. That's the there's two program. There are two uh, programs. One is a metropolitan program. One is an Iron Range program. And we do the association does support that program for the metropolitan area and does oppose having any diversions from the fiscal disparities pool to fund any specific objectives because um, we believe that it it compromises the statutory intent of that program, which is to make sure that all cities and jurisdictions share in the growth of the region uh, fairly. A um, couple of other issues, Madam Chair and members, um, the, uh, like the League, Metro Cities does support fixing, clarifying the online, sort of the intermediary issue for uh, lodging. Um, we do support that change to clarify to make sure that those taxes can be collected. We also support a study of the 4D program prior to any proposal to expand it. That has been something that's been considered in the past couple of years. Um, we do support the 4D rental classification program, but would prefer to see a study of um, the effects of any change of expansion. Uh, cities have some concerns that an expansion could have uh, unforeseen effects on uh, property tax payers and sort of create shifts that, we, uh, that they wanna understand before any change is enacted. Uh, tax increment financing is strongly supported by Metro Cities as a local tool. It's one of the few that cities have in order to do uh, redevelopment and economic development uh, projects. And we have supported and continue to support some clarif either clarifications to the laws or even some adjustments to the laws to provide more flexibility. And I'll leave it there for now because it's kind of a rabbit hole, sort of a, a weeds that we can get into 
Um, but suffice it to say, I will be in touch further on, on those issues as we um, continue to, to work on them. Um, I think I will just leave it there, Madam Chair and members. Um, very much appreciate your time today, and I look forward to working with you uh, in this division. Thank you, Ms. Nauman. Do members have any questions for Ms. Nauman? We're a little ahead of schedule, so probably shouldn't tempt fate that way, right? All right, thank you, Ms. Nauman. Next up, we have Mr. Mossman. Can you please introduce yourself, your organization for the record, and proceed? Uh, Madam Chair and members, Matt Mossman, Executive Director of the Minnesota Intercounty Association. And yes, I was thinking, don't tempt me. We appreciate that. But um, the Intercounty Association, uh, just quick background, is a 15 member uh, voluntary association, nonpartisan of counties from across the state, including 11 suburban and four, pardon me, four suburban and 11 greater Minnesota counties. And just we're characterized generally by being faster growing in kind of regional center counties. And many of you uh, represent all or a part of the counties. And I'll just quickly read so that you know, but across the state, Benton, Blue Earth, Carver, Chisago, Crow Wing, Dakota, Olmstead, Otter Tail, Rice, Scott, Sherburn, Stearns, St. Louis, Washington, and Winona are member counties. And I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and just talk a little bit about some of our uh, priority issues uh, for this committee and generally for the property tax. The property tax, of course, is critical, reliable uh, source of funding on average, according to the OSA, about 44% of total county revenues come from the property tax. And if you exclude the state general tax, over half of those taxes are paid by residential properties. So protecting property tax base really underlies nearly all of our platform provisions and frankly provisions both within the purview of this committee um, and across uh, the state budget. Let me talk a little bit about uh, what is we mean by protecting uh, the tax base because it, it comes in a, in a couple of different forms. We generally oppose or at least urge um, the legislature to exercise a great caution when considering uh, state uh, law changes that would propose to provide a property tax benefit uh, to either certain classes of property or to certain types of owners when the tax benefit is effectively achieved by shifting taxes uh, to other property taxpayers within the system. Um, I know that there's been calls, for example, and was just referenced to, to doing some study, for example, on 4D is a, is a example that I would give. We have been re, uh, reluctant to expansion of the 4D program, for example, and I wanna be clear that our members are very supportive actually of increased investment in the state, it's a priority for us in housing is a major issue and just making sure that rather than doing it through shifting property taxes that we're finding the most effective and, and cost effective way to do that. Another area uh, of importance is uh, understanding that counties uh, are largely responsible for administering state determined programs. Um, and not always fully uh, funded uh, by the state. County program aid and maintaining county program aid funding levels is a critical priority for us. And we are thankful uh, that the governor uh, proposed maintaining funding. Uh, we hope the legislature does the same. And you know, over time, and it might not be this session, but we also uh, recognize the importance of eventually returning to a conversation about how inflationary cost pressures uh, uh, require us to sort of revisit um, those funding levels and perhaps an inflationary screen. adjustment. Um, PILT is very important um, to a number of our member counties, particularly in Northern Minnesota. Um, uh, so we want to talk to the committee about making sure we not only support uh, uh, continuation of payment in lieu of taxes, but making sure when those lands are reappraised periodically as required under state law that there's not sudden uh, adjustments or particular and more importantly drops or declines in uh, those aid payments. I do want to just also just comment, um, you know, for all of you when we look at property taxes and the priorities of our counties, we also urge you to 
engage with your colleagues about the many ways, uh, particularly in a difficult budget year, how property taxes can be impacted in human services in terms of cost shares and maintenance of efforts requirements, community corrections, transportation where taxes were talked about earlier. So adequacy in a lot of other areas also ends up putting pressure on property taxes. Another way, frankly, just is that a number of counties are, have indicated um, that they're subsidizing deputy registrar offices, for example, in their counties because those fees uh, no longer pay for the cost of, of the operation. It's a complicated tax and we, I'll just close uh, Madam Chair and wrap up with obviously highly visible and highly regressive uh, tax as well. So we are very supportive and thank the legislature for the many years of being supportive of income-based uh, um, relief programs for uh, the property tax and we encourage uh, those to be uh, maintained and we also um, uh, embrace the Mr. Hilgart talked earlier about a number of the ways uh, that um, with regard to the potential Enbridge pipeline dispute and some other uh, property tax simplification issues we would uh, support those as well. And the final final would just be to say that we would welcome an opportunity to work with the committee. Um, all of our counties are concerned about uh, opportunities to find uh, simplification in the truth and taxation process, uh, both in terms of the publication of that and sort of the notification and the holding of those hearings and make sure that that is working and achieving the outcomes that are intended by the legislature for the public. With that, I'd happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mossman. Any questions, members, for Mr. Mossman? Give folks a second here. Seeing none, we'll move on to Ms. Larson. Ms. Larson, if you want to introduce yourself and state your organization for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's it's good to see you all, and it's also good to see my lobbying colleagues. I hope we'll all be together in person next session. I um, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm Jill Larson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Minnesota Business Partnership. For those that don't know the Business Partnership, our members are the CEOs or the senior leader of um, some of Minnesota's largest companies, um, most of which are headquartered here in Minnesota and our companies span across many industries. We have companies that are manufacturers, healthcare, retail, professional services, and um, together they employ um, about a half a million Minnesotans. Really appreciate the opportunity to share some comments, um, specifically with respect to your committee. Uh, this session, Madam Chair and members, um, our, our priorities, I guess, and our concerns are, are similar to what have been mentioned by others is to, um, hopefully prevent any property tax increases on businesses. Um, Minnesota is already a high business property tax state relative to other states. And so it does put our members at a competitive disadvantage. Um, Minnesota businesses are unique in a way that we pay both a local property tax and the class rate is higher than other properties. And we pay the state business property tax, the state general levy. It's commonly referred to as the state tax. Um, and our effective tax rate is nearly three times that of, of homesteads. So, and the state property tax affects employers of all sizes. It doesn't matter what size of a building you're in. You could have a small employer in a large building um, because the tenants that are in that building pay the property tax through their lease. And the state property tax can be anywhere from 25 to 30% of a property tax um, payer's bill. And I think this was mentioned by House Research last week in its presentation, but business property has about 12% of market value, but pays 28% of all the property taxes. So it is disproportionate. I wanted to mention, I think both Mr. Mossman and Mr. Hilgart mentioned the issue of shifting. And we agree with those concerns that any proposal um, not shift onto business property tax. That could be a class rate change. Um, that could be, for example, there have been proposals in the past to exempt a certain market value from the state property tax. Currently we exempt $100,000. We understand that um, those proposals and they were meant to help smaller businesses and they have, but if you don't sort of buy down the overall levy, you shift it onto the other businesses, including small and large businesses. And even if you do sort of buy down the levy, you get to a point if you exempt too much of the property where you're pretty much only having Metro 
properties pay for the tax. So that's a concern. Um, again, I think it was mentioned last week um, for in the in the metro area for a, a high valued uh, commercial property, we're seventh highest in the in the country for rural properties, sixth. So the state business property tax really is an, makes Minnesota an outlier. It's I think we're the only state that imposes the state property tax only on business property. And you know, an example I like to use or a comparison I like to use is many years ago, the legislature in a bipartisan manner decided to change the way that we um, impose corporate taxes. We used to um, impose corporate taxes based on your property sales and payroll. And people realized it was a disincentive to add property and payroll here. If you were taxing it um, that way, and it created a disincentive to bring employees here, expand your footprint. And the state business property tax seems to be creating some of the same type of disincentive. And as we're competing with other locations for business retention, expansion, um, anything the legislature does to make it more expensive to grow here is going to make it harder to recover from the current recession and, and for longer term growth. So as you work to put your division report uh, together this session, I'm hoping that you'll take this information and um, into consideration and, and not uh, enact anything that changes the class rate to shift onto business property or um, increases the state levy, that, anything that will result in a state and a business property tax increase. Really appreciate your time today. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sure I'll be in front of your committee um, uh, in the future and just really appreciate the, the time to introduce myself. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Members, any questions for Ms. Larson? All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Next up, we have Ms. Madden. Could you please introduce yourself and your organization for the record and proceed? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Nan Madden and I'm director of the Minnesota Budget Project. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, the Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And our mission is to identify and advance policy changes to make Minnesota a place where everyone can thrive, regardless of who they are or where they live. We work uh, primarily in the areas of tax, budget, and economic policy, and especially look at how those policy areas impact lower income Minnesotans and communities of color. So our top priority before this committee uh, is the renter's credit, um, which as you know, is a powerful tool that the state uses to put a limit on how much of a person's or a family's budget can go towards paying property taxes. The renter's credit provides a refund of, the, of a portion of the property taxes that renters have paid through their rents. And the renter's credit and the related homestead credit refund have a very strong effect on reducing the regressivity of the state's property tax system. The renter's credit reaches low and moderate renters, low and moderate income renters all across the state. And in many greater Minnesota counties, it's especially important for uh, seniors and people living with severe disabilities. And I really think the role of the renter's credit has never been more important than in these times where there are rising rents, tight incomes for renters, and because of the heavier impact of the pandemic and economic downturn on low-income people and people of color. Uh, so that's the main issue you will hear um, me talking about in front of this committee. Uh, we do at times weigh in on other tax policies that have an impact on the overall fairness and equity of the tax system, as well as the ability to sustainably fund uh, public services and our priorities as a state. Um, so an issue, another issue that we're supportive of this year are the efforts to ensure that homeowners who file their uh, taxes with an individual taxation identification number or ITIN, that those homeowners are, homeowners are able to gain homestead status for their homes. And finally, um, we do have an interest in the important role that aids to local governments play in ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to public services and thriving communities. So as you've heard from others, we would be concerned about uh, state budget cutting in that area. So uh, thank you for the time. Look forward to uh, additional conversation with the committee in this uh, legislative session. Thank you, Ms. Madden. Um, thank you testifiers for letting us know about your goals for the session. 
I want to open it up to members again to see if anybody has any questions for Ms. Madden or any of the other testifiers that you've thought of as we've been hearing their, hearing their testimony. Seeing no hands. I don't know if this is the joy of having an afternoon committee when everybody's tired or our testifiers just covered so much, we're all, we're all ready to go. So <laughs> seeing none, um, folks, next week we'll be meeting again on Wednesday, February 3rd. The plan is to hear from the assessors on the process on assessing property. And yes, to hear the first few of our bills that are currently in our division. Um, you see, uh, Representative Truckleton, did you have a question? I saw your hand raise a little bit. Nope, okay, just checking. Um, so no, we'll have our first show be us up next week and hear from the assessors. And until then, everybody have a wonderful rest of the week and we are adjourned.